All right, team, well, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our webinar this morning, The Hemet Story, featuring Rachel Syria and David Horton. My name, again, is Steve Ventura, Senior Professional Development Associate with the Leadership and Learning Center. And we are delighted you're here. We've got a great webinar set up for you. We've got a great function coming up in San Francisco on November 8th and 9th. Rachel will be there along with Larry Ainsworth and Dr. Angela Perry. And this is our Digging Deeper into the Common Core Standards um, seminar. These are absolutely fabulous seminars. Many of you know that Larry Ainsworth, Ainsworth is the author of Common Formative Assessments and um, Rigorous Curriculum Design. He is a fabulous speaker, and we've got two wonderful people in this um, conference, two experts, Dr. Angela Peary with Rachel Surya. So we think you're going to love that one. And here's the deal with this. If you go to this, if you hit this one, then you are eligible to be certified. And it's the last opportunity you will have to be certified. So if you want to do certification, it's in Las Vegas. Hey, what's wrong with that? And then you can go and um, become certified in the Digging Deeper Conference. So it is the prerequisite. And then you will be certified again with Rachel and Angela. So that one will be a winner for sure. Just a couple of other resources that we have to go along with the Common Core. We've got a great series, Navigation and Implementation of the Common Core. We've got several experts in these books. And so um, they come in a book package. If you'd like to take a look at them, all you have to do is go on the website and see what they have. But they, um, they're extremely helpful with the Common Core. So let's go ahead and um, talk about the Hemet Unified School District. I want to start off, number one, by introducing my colleague, Rachel Surya. She is a Senior Professional Development Associate with the Leadership and Learning Center. She's been in public education for over 19 years as a classroom teacher, a mathematics coach, and a uh, resource teacher. And now she's a full-time professional developer. I have to tell you, Rachel is a great friend. She's got a brand new book out called How to Reach and Teach English Language Learners. This is a winner, and her newest book is going to be released, Common Formative Assessments for English Language Learners. You're going to love Rachel. I'm glad she's on the line with us. Let's talk about David Horton. Um, Dr. Horton is the Director of Student Information and Accountability for the Hemet Unified School District located right here in Southern California. All of us are at home, finally, here in Southern Cal. He has previously served as a K-12 Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment Coordinator of Secondary Mathematics and K-12 Instructional Technology. Also, he's been a high school assistant principal, and he's been in the classroom for math and science. He is a great, um, great role model here in terms of implementation and what the district has done. I know David. I've worked with him before. I know he believes that every student can learn, especially if the teachers that are teaching his students have really good world-class professional development. So without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and um, let Rachel begin. And um, welcome, you two. How's everybody doing? Doing great. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. Um, Dr. Horton, we would like to just focus and, and get right into the Hemet story, because there's so much for you to share with us today. And we're really excited about this opportunity. The first thing I'd like to ask is if you could share with us just some of the demographics um, of Hemet Unified School District and the population that you serve in Hemet. Sure, no problem. Thanks, Steve and Rachel. Um, good morning, everyone. A little bit about Hemet, just so you can put a, a mental picture to what we're talking about and, and what our district's about. We have about 21,500 students in the district. Um, it's a very large geographical district that can go from um, up in the mountains, very rural, to very suburban and even some urban feeling type schools. Uh, we have 49% of our students are Hispanic, 37% white, 8% African American. Uh, we are about we range between 73 to 77 percent free and reduced lunch, uh, socioeconomic disadvantage type students. English learners, we have 15 percent, and our special education makes up about 13 percent of our kids. We have 26 schools uh, in the district. Four of those are comprehensive high schools. So I think that should give you a, a, a pretty good mental picture of who we are. Thank you. So let's, let's move on. Sure. Let's talk about initiative fatigue, and I know that, um, Rachel, this is something that you and I um, are really in tune as we do professional development across the country. We know that frantic coverage of everything does not lead to better results. So let's talk about, David, about what they're doing in Hemet. Absolutely. So, David, I know that uh, that feeling of being overwhelmed is, is one that we can all identify with right now, and, 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 and that just sense of doing way too much, not being able to focus. And, and what's really interesting about Hemet is, 
is that you really saw the implement, implementation of the Common Core Standards as an opportunity to address this initiative fatigue. So I'd like you to just share with us how, how you did that. Sure. It, it starts actually a couple of years ago, and I think uh, I would imagine it rings true with many of the, the listeners or participants today, is as we're looking at exiting this No Child Left Behind era and moving into the Common Core state standard era, um, what we were noticing, and I'm sure many can, can relate to this, is we started to notice as the pressures and the accountability of No Child Left Behind continue to pile on, we continue to recognize this tendency that we had of wanting to find the next silver bullet uh, or the next magic program that would fix something that we were noticing in a school that was struggling. If they were on that road to program improvement or knee deep in program improvement, it became this very attractive thing to want to find a silver bullet or a magic program to try and fix it. What we started to find as we would take a step back and look at all that we were doing with that, and, and we would talk with teachers and hear from principals and others, we would notice that the feeling of drowning was almost a universal feeling. They were feeling that it was one more thing being added, but nothing being taken away. And mm -hmm. we kept watching this and feeling it, but, but then there was that panic always of, well, we've got to keep ahead of this program improvement, no child left behind machine that keeps turning. So this feeling of all this stuff piling on, nothing coming off, and we started to look at it to think there, there's got to be a different way. There's got to be a better way, especially heading for the common core, to think of are there ways to take things away, to streamline, to focus, instead of let's fall into the same tendency of let's add, add, add. We wanted to find was there a way to take some things away and be purposeful about what those things were. Yeah, that's such a great great explanation because I know Rachel agrees with me. This, there, there's no connection between this, but we see people try to do exactly what you said. Um, implementing the Common Core is about people, not programs. It's about staff, not stuff. And you know as well as I do, David, for every dollar we invest in the competence of your staff and other staffs across the country, those districts are going to get a greater gain in student achievement than if they were to take that same money and buy another program. So we know that when, you know, implementation is free. And I think that people begin to look for that magic bullet program like you mentioned. So, um, Rachel, why don't we um, have David talk a little bit about how we could um, maybe, you know, get to this um, this strategy for every new initiative we implement, we must be willing to take two ineffective initiatives off the plates of teachers. Absolutely, and I think it starts with with this um, acknowledgement that we just can't do it all, and and we have uh, mounds of research showing that that there's just way too much that we're trying to cover um, versus that idea of focusing. So, David, why don't you talk to us a little bit about um, that the the focus on prioritizing the Common Core and, and finding your power standards and how that led you uh, down this, this path uh, to focus. Right. I, I think as we took a step back to look at this uh, kind of honest assessment of what we were doing, why we were doing it, and did it have a purpose, you know, we started to recognize that it wasn't just um, looking at what teachers were doing in classrooms with the standards or the instruction. It also was a layer above that. We were looking at what were our schools doing and then in fact we looked at what the district was doing and so all these things started to come into an alignment where we wanted to have an honest conversation to say look if we keep piling on and we keep trying to do too much we're really not doing anything at all and by doing by having so many things in our focus nothing's getting accomplished and, and everything becomes lukewarm and not effective and so on. So as we had that conversation and we looked at this opportunity of moving into the Common Core to say, let's approach it differently. Let's, let's learn from the lessons of our past. Let's think of what's worked, what hasn't. Let's, let's talk about the things that, are, that have potential, the things that don't. Let's talk about what we can drop out. So obviously then what circles back in that conversation is we've got to talk about the classroom. We've got to talk about teachers and kids and what really goes on. And that became this focus of the power standards, of, of of having the willingness to say, you know, we cannot do it all. We're, we're not, the research is clear on that. There's too many standards. If you try and focus on all of them, you really get nothing done uh, effectively or done well. 
So we said, well, then can we come to a narrow focus and say, can we monitor a few things? And by doing that, um, we, can, we can then look at our practice on those few things to see if we are making a difference. And it led us to a notion of uh, how can we have a structured conversation around the few things, monitor those, and start watching our own practice to see you know, how we're doing it. So kind of that idea of coverage versus focus, instead of us simply covering things for the sake of, I want to get to the end of this unit or this chapter or whatever, it became, can I do and monitor something inside that unit or that chapter very well and see if we're making a difference and then have a way for teachers and schools and the district to have uh, a common language to say, is that working? How is it working? Uh, and get away from this thing of let's pile on one more thing. Let's talk about a few things and do them well. Right. And, and, and I, I think to, one is, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Rachel. Rachel. No, you go okay. ahead. Okay. Well, I was, yeah, this, this, um, I think that visual, that, that slide with the, um, that we were just on, Steve, the slide right before this, it, it also, I think, really reiterates the, the sense that um, this process is empowering for teachers. It's putting that power back in the hands of, of educators. And rather, rather than feeling that we're having all of this done to us, we can finally um, arrive at a point where we feel like we can take control of the process and we can take control and, and decide what it is that we're going to focus on, what it is that we're going to monitor, how we're going to intervene, um, how we're going to provide support for our students. And I think that that is a lot of the, a lot of the conversation that I know I hear in Hemet when I'm there um, working and supporting, and supporting you through this process. Exactly. And I usually ask our clients two things. Number one, are all standards created equal and are all of them really required to have kids move to the next level with the confidence and readiness to learn. And of course, we're not telling people to skip standards when they prioritize the standards. But many people tell me, yes, they're all important, Steve. They will all be tested, and we have to teach every single one of them. Well, that's question number one. But question number two is, does the school year adequately give you enough time to teach every single standard? And so here comes the issue. Um, do we want perfect coverage or focus? Most people would like to go deeper with fewer because they see the results. Teachers go home with lower blood pressure. They come back the next day with a, an enthusiasm to work. So, um, Rachel, why don't you talk a little bit about, you know, uh, with David about what, what, why it's so important to, you know, get to these focused initiatives and see what can happen with them. Right, right. So, so David, this is along those same lines with initiative fatigue and, and the, the idea of, of finding some high impact initiatives and really focusing um, time resources on those focused initiatives um, rather than being so scattered and trying to do so much. So why don't you walk us through this? Sure. The, the thing I would say is, is that, again, probably ringing true with a lot of the participants or the callers on, on the webinar is, as you, as you first have that honest conversation with those, whether it's at your grade level team, your school, or your district about what we're doing and why, and then this opportunity of moving to the Common Core State Standards and what that's going to mean, especially as the new assessments are upon us and so forth, was this notion of, of first having that, that structured, narrow focus on the standards that matter the most to us and a conversation that's driven from the teacher empowerment level, where the teachers are the ones having the, the discussion and the decision making to say, these are the standards in our district that we value the most. These are going to be the ones that have the highest impact. They're going to be the ones that are going to take us toward the assessment with greater efficacy. They're going to be the ones that uh, <clears throat> we can do professional development around or what have you. But it starts with first having that selection of what are the things that we value the most. Let's get those on paper. Let's talk about them. And then it leads us into this, this piece, though, of saying, well, if we identify those power standards, those high priority standards, what is the level of rigor that those standards really are asking for? What, what depth and quality do students need to reach in order to have mastered or for us to say they've mastered? And so we then embarked on a process where we're able to unwrap those standards but do it in this narrow focused way and the structure that we've been doing that in is a, a data teams process so that we have a structured format where teachers can come together in a purposeful way where there's a structure to the meetings and the time that they have 
But in doing it, part of that work is this unwrapping the standard where they can do that together to have the conversation about the rigor that this standard is asking for both teaching and learning, uh, how we're going to focus on that, how we know we've arrived, uh, and what that will look like. And then part of that is that, that next uh, little oval that you see of the common formative assessment. And that was, if we're going to go to the trouble of identifying this power standard, and we're going to go to the trouble of unwrapping this standard, and we're doing, then how are we going to measure that it's happened, but do it in a way where it's informative to both teacher and student, um, you know, not done simply for a grade in the book, but done in a way to say, have students mastered this? Where are they? And if they have, what will I do with those that have learned it? And if they have it, what will I do with those that haven't uh, mastered it yet? And, and the, the, the thing that we're noticing in our district now by having this structure of, of data teams and this conversation that we think is, is anchoring us well to move toward the common core is we can have a narrowed conversation now and teachers can come to the place of saying, if we see things and we talk together, we can change tomorrow in the classroom what, what we've identified as a need. Whereas in the past, we would find that it would be vast stretches of time between a benchmark assessment or even you know one time a year with a state assessment and saying, oh, now we've seen if the students have or haven't learned it. By doing these shorter cycle common formative assessments, it gives teachers and students this uh, a, a greater dipstick uh, ability to say, where am I right now? And teachers can change today and tomorrow what they're doing instead of waiting for weeks or months. David, would you agree, and I guess, and then we're going to move on to our first poll, would you agree that it's not the number of initiatives a district can implement, it's the degree of implementation that will actually make a difference? Yes, as a matter of fact, and that's a great point. Back in the kind of the early stages of this for us and transitioning with uh, data teams now moving toward the common core and kind of um, this, this shift from the old world to the new world, if you will, it really is that. It's become a conversation now that is gaining momentum to say, let's not talk about doing 150 things, all of them mediocre. Let's talk about doing the three or four things that matter the most and go deep with the implementation and give teachers the time, the conversation ability, um, the empowerment together as a teacher unit, whether it's a grade level or a discipline, to say, let's do something, let's go deep and find if this thing is working for us and our kids. And if it is, let's do more of that. But also the empowerment to say, if we find that we're doing something and it's not working, let's let it go or ask for more professional development to say, let's learn how to do it better. Right. Right. So here's what I want to do with our listeners then. We want to go into our first poll, and I believe you can see the question. We would like you to be able to just tell us right now in your organization, as your district moves to implementing the Common Core, which is, going to, is very time intensive, um, what is the level of initiative fatigue um, in your school? It's a single answer now. Pick one, A, B, or C, and go ahead and use your poll function. Let's see what we've got here. Kathy, I don't believe I'm getting any um, uh, polls in right now. Is there a function? Let's see. If people can use their question function, perhaps, unfortunately, the, the uh, rather than launching it, it was closed. So if people can use their question function, let us know. Uh, where you are in regard to the number of um, initiatives. Thank you. We see the results coming in now. Excellent. Okay. okay. Yeah, everybody has um, got a lot on their plates. Yeah, I wish I could show you the results, friends. I'm sorry what happened with our with, with the tech, technical issue here. So, um, but we've got a lot of A's and B's. 
And here's the next portion of the webinar, then, if this is true. Now, if we've got, we've got these things going, let's talk a little bit more about the initiative fatigue. I'm, uh, fatigue. I want to lead this in with Rachel, because here it is. The, um, the, the, the rule of six is something that we try to follow at the Leadership and Learning Center. Maybe, Rachel, you can set that up and help people understand what that is. Right, right. So, so, and we're going to let David uh, also talk us through some of these action steps. But what we wanted to provide for you, the listeners um, and participants on this webinar, are some some things that you can actually do now. So, so what can you turn around after this webinar and actually use? Um, and one of the things you can do is is pause, take stock of current initiatives, and really. Um, have that honest conversation that David was referring to a little earlier. And, and with the rule of six, um, the research in Missouri found that, that when you go beyond that, you actually start to have an inverse effect. You start to have a, 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 um, a negative impact on student achievement. And, and that's actually not what we're looking for. And, and, and in all actuality, it makes sense because it gives us all that sense that we're so scattered, we're not focused. Um, and, and in the end, our students end up paying the price. So this is a really important topic. And, and um, David, I'll let you talk us through that. Yeah, the, the second bullet, I think, is a place that, that I think many of the callers or participants on the webinar can relate to, is thinking about the things that you're doing, uh, the things that teachers are being asked to do, or that schools are being asked to do, or as a district you're asking people to do, and then to t take a step back and say, but how effectively are we doing any of those? And for us, it was a real um, eye-opening experience. It was a bit sobering, really, to take a step mm -hmm. back and, and realize that to really uh, you know, qualify anything to say that we've implemented it, we, we use some of the same research to look at it and say, well, if 90% of the teachers aren't doing it 90% of the time, Let's hold that as our standard to say if something's being implemented or not, because how will we ever know if that thing is making a difference in their, their practice or in their classroom or uh, in their teams or whatever? And that became, uh, as we would talk about this with our administrative teams and then go back to the schools and do this, it really becomes an interesting conversation because people start to realize and say, you know, all that stuff that kept being pushed down on us we never had the time to fully implement that and make it work before the next thing came. Mm -hmm. And so we would, we would start to find this stuff. And, and it, you know, I think many callers can probably relate. It's that idea of you go into some teacher's classrooms and you see there's still stuff wrapped in cellophane and it hasn't even been unpacked because the next thing arrived before they could ever fully implement the first thing. And so we then wonder, well, why isn't this school or this grade level or whatever making progress? And really what it was is they were just drowning in one thing after another coming. So that notion on the third bullet of weeding the garden really became uh, something important to us to say, let's not just talk about it, let's model it, let's give schools the empowerment to do it. And say, if you're finding things that aren't working or aren't implemented well, then give yourselves permission to let some of those things go. Uh, find a way to buy yourself more time, buy yourself freedom in the classroom and other things so that you feel like you're making a difference and you're not trying to implement every single thing that has ever come your way because you don't have time to do that, let alone teach the you know 150 standards or whatever you're trying to get done. So it really is an empowerment piece, but, but it does require some careful planning uh, and then some structured conversation for people to have a, a productive way of deciding what they can let go of. Absolutely. Thank you for that. So we're going to move on to our next big idea in the Hemet story, and that's really the, the focus on data. And, and along those same lines with, with initiative fatigue, I think that this DRIP syndrome that, we, um, that was um, introduced to us by the Dufours is, is really um, true in a lot of our schools, a lot of our districts, a lot of the classrooms that we work that w and with the teachers I know that I work with, where they're almost paralyzed by data. Um, they, have, they either have too much or they don't have enough. They don't have the right data, the data that they're using. Um, because data is so important, because assessment is so important, and it's, it's where we base our decisions, our, our inferences are made, 
um, some of us are finding that we're making the wrong inferences because the assessment isn't aligned to the rigor of the standard that you were that you were talking to us about earlier in that unwrapping process. So, so it's not just too much data. Sometimes it's the wrong data, um, and you guys really addressed that. Um, feeling of, of being data rich and from information poor. Um, so talk to us about not just the amount of data, but, but more importantly, how you got teachers to use data in Hemet. Yeah, that, you set it up really well. The, the, probably the realization or, or kind of that awakening moment for us was um, that if you think of a district level, school level, classroom level, or, or grade level, we started to have finally, I think, a very honest look and conversation that all three of those different levels need different data for different reasons. And they then will want to access that data in a unique way, and they're going to then want to use it in a unique way. So instead of a, a one-size-fits-all, because there, there's no shortage of data that we have at any one level, but what we noticed was is that the data that may be important for district administration becomes not very important for school sites. And then we would notice that school sites, as far as relation to the grade level or to teacher teams, again, not very interesting or important. So we had to then kind of rethink it and say, well, instead of a top-down kind of thing where we just keep pushing data on people and say, here, here's the data, this will fix you, we turned it around to say, wait a minute, what do teachers really need on a day-to-day -day basis or a week-to-week -week basis that makes a difference to them? so that we don't just push things to say, here, drown in this data. So it was back to that data team's idea we were talking about. It was having a structured format where teachers could come together, look at common formative assessments that were short cycle, that, that deal with them and their content and their kids. They then get the data they really want to see about, are my kids moving? Are they growing? And if they're not, what can I do about it? And so on we started to realize that the real power of all this was less is more. Letting the teachers only get to the things they really needed when they really needed it and leave the school level stuff and the district level stuff out of their world unless they want to play there. But it really creates more of a freedom that they can get into it and say, now I've got the stuff that I need. I can get the data that's going to make a difference for me. And I don't have to drown in all the other stuff. I'll let other people worry about that. And that was a real shift that as we're kind of heading toward this common core that I think is a, a great place to position uh, oneself is, is how to let the teacher empowerment piece be the driver that they can look at the things that matter to them and keep the other stuff away from them. They can have access to it if they want to see it, but most of the time we found it is so irrelevant or boring to them they really don't care. They really want to know, is my classroom moving? Is my grade level moving? And is our school, are we OK? And once they've got that, they don't care about all the state level this and accountability that. Uh, so that, that, I think, is something for people to bear in mind as we head into this common core, is how to make that streamlined and not drown in all that stuff. That's, that's a great right. explanation. Give. We've got to get on to the next, the next poll here. And I'll, I, I just sure. want to validate your statement, because Rachel knows this as well as I do. It's the formative assessment piece that's going to help people make the instructional decisions from day to day, not a once a release, not a once a year release data set where um, people look at it. Hey, we looked at the data; these kids moved on to the next year. We're not quite sure that feedback is accurate, fair, timely, and understandable. It's your short-term uh, formal uh, formative assessments that'll make the difference. Now, our wonderful director, our senior marketing director, Kathy Schultz, is on the line with us to help us launch this next poll. So what we want to ask people is, how often are you looking at data right now? You know, A is once a year all the way through D, nine or more times a year. And I'm wondering, Kathy, if you can go ahead and announce that uh, or uh, launch that. I'll see if I can look at the results. All right, we're getting a nice response, very nice. And I'm just going to leave this open, um, just another 30 seconds or so, we've got about 60% of our listeners have voted. So let's see when um, the voting slows down. I'd love to be able to close the poll and share the results with you. So um, just about 15 more seconds to get your vote in. All right, now, um, I don't know, Kathy, if you want to um, share the results, um, or I can do it on my end, I believe. 
Yeah, they are right now, Steve. Okay. All right, so um, and unfortunately, something's right over my numbers, so I can't see what they say. <laughs> do you guys okay, see what, them? What, do you see them, Steve? Otherwise, what we have is 41%, say nine or more times a year, Okay. 33%, five to eight, 23, two to four, and 2% once a year. That is perfect. Yeah, I've got a I've got a little monitor that's I'm kind of overlooking the um, the poll results. So, and this is great. Again, David, congratulations on your focus for data. Um, Rachel and I agree, and many of the people that we work with, our clients, school districts, understand that yes, accountability is really important. But these kids are over tested and they are under assessed. Everybody knows that it's the big elephant in the room. What's going to change the culture of a school is more regular, frequent assessment, not a once a year high stakes accountability test. But that's the world we live in. It's just that sometimes it doesn't yield the very best data for us. Rachel, why don't we go ahead and talk a little bit more about um, our process and how David has incorporated the, the um, data-driven decision making. Right, right. Just to wrap up that that uh, conversation you were just uh, finishing up, the, that those formative assessments, and, and David, I'm sure you'll agree with this, um, I always say this when I'm working with a team of teachers, that a common formative assessment is not the same thing in, as an assessment in common. So it's not that we're all using the chapter one same assessment. It's, it's deeper than that. It's the sense of looking at the standard, defining what that standard truly means, then taking a look at that chapter one assessment and saying, are these items truly aligned to that standard, to the rigor of that standard, and making some decisions collaboratively as a team um, by setting that bar. This is what proficient is, and this is what our common formative assessment um, is going to show us. So that, I think, is a big part of the, of the process in HEMIT and kind of moves us really nicely because we have a bullet there that focuses on, on that formative and summative assessment piece. But David, why don't you talk to us about some of the action steps that not just HEMIT took, but that our participants can look at um, after they've participated in the, in the webinar today. Right. As, as we looked at the, the challenge and the opportunity of moving from the old world to the common core new world, um, one, of that, one of those pieces, and, and you kind of heard it in some of the earlier uh, slides that we went through, was having that structured um, format of a data team allowed the, it was kind of the foundational piece to allow really high-powered conversations to come out with teachers where they were traveling as a unit. They weren't, you know, one person on their own. It was having this group of teachers that could come together to talk about what are we doing and what are we trying to do with a certain standard and what uh, instructional strategy might we use and how will we see if what we did caused the learning to happen or caused it not to happen. And then using those common formative assessments to check for understanding and mastery along the way became this empowerment thing. And what I would what I would encourage people to look at is the power behind all of that becomes after uh, the folks learn the, the process, the structure, the power then becomes in the conversations that they start to have. And once you get people beyond simply going through the mechanics of how to run that sort of a data team meeting, but they get to the real power of a conversation uh, we're starting to see that now in our district, that having put this in place for uh, moving into our second year with it, the, the difference now is there are teacher teams across our district having conversations that in my time in Hemet I've never heard held before. They're talking about themselves, their practice, and their, their kids in a way that is so powerful because they're willing to look at things to say, what are we going to do and how will we know if it works? And then when we get back together, we're going to talk about the things we observed. So they're bringing in data of, of all variety. They're bringing in student work. They're bringing in assessment results. They're bringing in summative, common formative. They're bringing anything they can get their hands on to make these inferences about not just what they are doing, but what their students are doing. And, and they're starting to realize the power and see the power in their own ability to drive that. And, and it's a very, very... Uh, infectious kind of thing to watch happen. Once a team gets into this place, uh, they really don't want to let it go. They want to continue doing it. And, and so we feel that transitioning to the Common Core now is going to be a very smooth one in that regard because that foundation is there 
for teachers to talk to one another and support one another, and they're getting the data they need in, in the timely manner that they want it. Absolutely. Um, so, and that, that just moves us so nicely into this next big idea, which is time. And, and Steve, you mentioned the elephant in the room. I think this is the other elephant in the room. Um, we, we are struggling to find time to do everything that needs to be done. And we know that now that moving into this Common Core, into the Common Core and implementing the Common Core, that we need to be very strategic. We need to be very deliberate in what we do and how we implement and how we move forward with implementation. Um, and in Hemet, you really tackled this time issue head on. And I'd like you to share with us um, how you did that, how you managed to bring everybody to the table and, and really be able to carve out some time for your teachers to do this really important work. Sure. Back to that idea of, of the data teams that we put in as a structure for teachers and teacher teams to get together to talk. Um, at first, and one thing for the listeners to understand, and I know some of you may already enjoy this, but we didn't and that was having a, a time every week for teachers to get together, a release time, if you will, for them to have nothing, you know, no students around, it's them, it's their time. We didn't have that in our district. And so when we began this process of, of putting our data teams in place and getting ready to transition into what we want to do with the Common Core and roll that out, we recognized that that wasn't there, but we wanted to move there. And one of the things that, that helped move it there, believe it or not, was putting the data teams in place, the thing that became so loud and clear across the entire district is everywhere we would go, the first thing everyone would say, principal, assistant principal, teacher, leader, teacher, no matter who it was, they would say, we need more time. We need more time. We want to have time to talk about this together. So we began a process and a conversation with our teacher association, with, with our union, to work with us at the district level to... Yes. It was a quick question for you. We've got a participant that's asking a question, so I didn't want to get too far. If you can answer this, the question is very good. How do your teams determine a particular initiative isn't working when you have so many that might be impacting student achievement? So it's a great question from Margaret. Her question about your data teams is, and we understand the importance of collaboration, but one of the listeners wants to know, when you determine an initiative isn't working when you have so many, what really is the determination level to decide if this is something we're going to continue or discontinue? Yeah, one of the things that, that we would do in that, and that's a great question, we would, um, we would go back to uh, the, the root place of that. In other words, it would be through teacher teams and school level teams and giving them the empowerment to look at things to say, uh, we've identified something that may not be as effective as it could be, and we've created communication uh, links between those different groups so that, that not too much time goes by before someone can provide feedback to the next layer in the organization. So if a teacher team discovers it and gives it to a principal, a principal is never more than two or three or four weeks away from a format where they can come back and share it with their job-alike group, with other principals to say, hey, I'm noticing this is an issue, are you? Then that can then feed up to senior district administration as well to say, hey, there's something here that an entire uh, group has seen. What do we want to do about that? And then it allows us to go back and examine it from all different layers in the organization. And as soon as we look at something that uh, we find everyone saying, this isn't effective, then we, we can send that communication back down to people and say, hey, maybe you need to relax on this one. Um, let that one move along and, and you know use it as you see fit. But if you see something else is working better, let's do that. So it, it kind of feeds back to the data team process of, when teachers find things that work, we want them to have the empowerment to say, let's do more of that. But we do it as a group. It's not an individual decision. Um, not one teacher makes that choice. Not one school makes that choice. So we, we've built this empowerment, but also a communication link to keep everybody moving together so we're all headed for the same harbor. We're not, not, not having them drift away. Great, perfect. And so we were going to transition now into the time that teachers are given to collaborate. It looks like it was, it's a weekly meeting for data teams, and then they um, probably have an agenda with minutes that you folks probably collect and, and break down. So um, uh, in your data team meetings, um, are they weekly, David, every week, and for how long? Yeah, great question. So, so as I was saying before, the, working with our association, we worked to a place where we could bring in, as part of our contract, a weekly meeting 
so that teachers had that time. And so you're right. In that meeting, then, it's set aside every Tuesday morning for them to uh, get together, and it's time for data teams and, and other work that they may do. But you're right. It's a very structured thing. There, there's agenda. There's minutes. It's very thoughtful. They don't, they don't arrive at Tuesdays without knowing what they're going to do. So they, they arrive there. They have student data that's ready. It's printed. It's available. They bring in student work. They talk about their own uh, uh, instructional strategies they've been focusing on. So when our teachers arrive at the meeting, they're ready to go. And it's, it's amazing, even still, um, I think a fantastic byproduct of it is so many of the teachers that are into the, the Tuesday uh, collaboration time, they even ask now for more. Uh, they look at it and say, wow, you know, imagine what we could do with 90 minutes instead of 60. So it's a really wonderful thing to watch happen, but it really is starting at the teacher level. They're the ones that become excited about it. They're starting to see the power of traveling with their colleagues and not doing things alone. So it's a very uh, infectious process. That is, that is such a great answer. So, and Rachel, could you just go over quickly, what are the five definitive steps for a data team, just so our friends know that are listening, I mean, this is what's really happening in Hemet? Absolutely. So, so with the data teams process, and again, for those schools who are working with professional learning communities, um, data teams is not anything that contradicts a professional learning community. They actually fit very nicely together. We like to say that a professional learning community is what we are. A data team is what we do. It's the work that a professional learning community does. And so those five steps that they do are they first collect and chart their data, then they analyze that data for strengths and obstacles, um, and make some inferences from that data. What, what, so for those students who are proficient, what are some next steps for them? Where are we taking them? Um, they set some SMART goals in step three. Um, step four, they start talking about instructional strategies. And then step five is probably the most valuable step, which is where you set the bar for how will we know if it's working. So here's the strategies we said we're going to use. Now what are those signposts? What are those red flags that we're going to set up for ourselves in the, in the road, on the journey to proficiency that will tell us whether these strategies are working or not. We can't afford to wait until the end. We have to make mid-course corrections um, in the process. So we set those up in step five. And that brings us into the guaranteed and viable curriculum. Our last big idea um, here with Hemet, and we're down to our last few minutes, um, David. So if you could just uh, talk to us a little bit about how the Common Core Standards really gave you the opportunity to um, ensure that every student had access to a guaranteed and viable curriculum in Hemet. Sure. If you look at the, the last uh, sub-bullet there, the, the quote from uh, Dunkel, it, I think that really is a, an important piece for us. And it's one I would encourage any of the, the listeners to, to consider is whatever it is you choose to do, be thoughtful, uh, take small, deliberate steps to move toward the target where you're headed, and realize that it's not too late ever to begin. Uh, it doesn't matter if you know the Common Core feels like it's underway or the assessment feels like it's right on top of us or whatever. It's it's not that. I think it, it speaks more to a value set and a belief of all kids can learn, we can do this, we have the right professionals in the classroom. If they're empowered and trained well, they can do it. So we looked at this to say what are those steps to move us from where, where wherever we've been to where we want to go. And then the top two bullets, I think, are, are key pieces for anyone to consider. And one is, does everyone in the organization have a common vocabulary? Are you, are you using words like formative assessment the same way? Are you using words like collaboration the same way? Are you thinking about data the same way? And if not, um, build in systems of professional development and vocabulary. And it seems like you keep beating the same drum, but you have to, is to give everybody that same opportunity to use words the same way. And then the top bullet has been a very important one for us. We recognize that with any change process, it, it change is a, is a process. And it takes time for people to shift from wherever they've been to wherever they, you want them to go or for them to go. And we had to then provide the professional development for our teacher leaders and for our administrators at the sites. How do you run these meetings if there might be a colleague there that's less than thrilled at being around the table? And how do you encourage them to continue moving and keep going and keep going? Um, and and there's, there are plenty of tools and resources out there, but it's a very thoughtful step to consider because things won't be smooth all the time, and we have to be able to help people along the way. So a good professional development backbone um, 
to help people with difficult situations or with change is a crucial piece for anyone to consider as you begin the, uh, launching these things. Well, and this is a great thing, uh, but this top bullet, I just want our listeners to understand that we work in a lot of client school districts that have the mantra that says we've got the vision, we need the buy-in, and then we'll act. That really isn't the right formula, and Hemet didn't do it that way. It's not vision, buy-in, action. It's vision, action, and buy-in. No one's going to buy into anything until they see what it looks like when it's implemented. So don't wait for the perfect storm, correct? We will never get 100% buy-in anyway, but we can get 80 to 90% action first. And when people see something implemented, they're naturally um, attracted to doing it more, especially if the results are positive. So I have got a couple of questions we've got to get to before we sign up. I just want to make sure we've got one question from Wendy who asked, do you have a good tool for an audit? And Wendy, the center does. Um, I, I, I know, I'm not quite sure, so sure what the exact question is, but we've got an audit to help you weed your garden, to help you decide what initiatives you want to keep, what initiatives you want to um, um, uh, maybe um, review or evaluate. You can send that um, an email to Rachel, and I'll send her the document. Rachel can reply back to you. And I, if, I was just checking to see if there's any more questions from any of the listeners um, about what they've heard this morning. We've got some, we've got some great information. Um, and so um, the um, the questions, I've got a few more coming in. Let's see. Um, OK, um, from Kyla, David, and you'll have to be brief here. Could you help her understand how you negotiated more time with your teacher's union? Yeah, the, the piece along the way was we started uh, a conversation with our executive board first. And what I mean by that is we went through kind of a professional development step with them to talk with them about the things we were doing, where we wanted to go, and how powerful it would be for teachers. As we got them more and more um, with a level of understanding, it allowed us to then have them be working with us. Um, so it wasn't an us versus them. They were one of us. We were them. And we were talking about, this is where we want to go, and it's a powerful place for teachers and for kids. And it became irresistible uh, for them. They became partners in it. So I would encourage anyone going through that is, you've got to start with small steps, but it begins with quality professional development and conversation about where you want to go and giving everybody that vocabulary and understanding about why you're doing that. That's great. And Rachel, I'm going to send you this um, implementation audit matrix. A lot of people are asking for a copy of it. They'll probably email you. Um, Joel and a few other people have chimed in, so I'll send you that. Rachel, any other comments or closing statements? No, I would just like to thank everyone for taking part in in our webinar this morning. And I think that hopefully you, you're walking away with some great first steps that you can take. Um, we are certainly always available to answer questions, um, to help in any way. Please feel free to contact us. Uh, uh, Steve is going to show you a slide in a, in a minute here that will give, us our con give you your contact information. And the other thing I wanted to mention, when you go to that link in 24 hours that Steve was mentioning earlier, where you'll be able to download the slides and um, um, the, the recording, there was also an article. Um, and this webinar was based on that article. It's written by David Horton. Um, uh, Dr. Horton and, and um, one of his colleagues wrote this article about the Hemet journey um, and where, where they started, where they've been. So please visit that resource tab, download that article, read it. It's, it's wonderful, and um, it gives you a lot more detail than we may have been able to go into here on the webinar in 45 minutes. For 50 Perfect. And so I'm getting some more. And, and Dr. Horton, thank you so much. The information you revealed to us has been absolutely critical, and we loved having this time with you, Rachel. More people are coming in on the email for the um, for the implementation matrix. So, folks, hang on. I'm, I'm going to show you how to email Rachel right now. She'll have that document for you. I just want to remind everybody: don't forget forget about our Common Core State standards going beyond awareness to implementation. That'll be November 8th and 9th in San Francisco, featuring keynote speaker Larry Ainsworth with Dr. Perry and our famous Rachel right here online. She'll be there. And then don't forget, if you attend that, you will be able to become certified with an additional three days training in Las Vegas. This is a great thing to have. You will get a three-year um, license agreement from the center. We'll give you all our intellectual property so you can continue to be the expert in your own district as these things roll through. Once again, folks, we've got some great resources for the Common Core, starting with our first book, book one, 
navigation or the implementation of the Common Core. I actually contributed that book. There's a 100-day action plan in that book about how to implement the Common Core and goes all the way through the end of the um, series, which is book four. So um, we're going to go ahead and close things down. If you want to just give us a little more feedback before you leave, you can tell us what other um, webinar sessions you might like to have us conduct, and we'll be happy to do that. Otherwise, we'll be closing things down. Again, Dr. Horton, thank you so much. Rachel, always a pleasure. Hope everybody has a great weekend, and we'll see you soon. Steve, Steve can you put up the, yeah. the, um, the uh, email addresses, please? Yes, I think that's absolutely. the next slide. One more. Here we go, right here. There we go. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kathy, and thanks, Dr. Horton and Rachel. Thank you.